Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Hugh McKay and I'm president of the Board of Directors of the City Club. Shortly after his appointment as Secretary of the Interior, today's speaker, Ken Salazar, declared at a news conference that there was a, quote, new sheriff in town. Well, Secretary Salazar had his work cut out for him in taking over a department that had been beset by various problems. Prior to Secretary Salazar's arrival, the Department of Interior's Inspector General had testified before Congress that, quote, short of a crime, anything goes at the highest levels of the Department of the Interior. Now, Secretary Salazar has done much to get the department back on track. Mr. Salazar is a core member of what some environmentalists call a, quote, green dream team of environmental advisors appointed by President Obama shortly after his inauguration along with the heads of energy, uh, EPA, and other agencies. Mr. Salazar still considers himself a farmer and a rancher in all of his free time. He is known as a staunch conservationist and an opponent of developing oil shale on public lands. Mr. Salazar's family has lived in Colorado for five generations, and Salazar has helped found Santa Fe, New Mexico in the late 1500s, decades before the Mayflower set sail. That also means, as he sometimes says, that he is not quite Mexican-American because his ancestors arrived before there was a Mexico, or a United States for that matter. It was a border that came over us, Mr. Salazar says. We didn't come over the border. <laughs> Secretary Salazar grew up with seven siblings on a Colorado ranch that lacked electricity and a telephone, where he gained a genuine love for the land and all that it means to our country. At Interior, Mr. Salazar is charged with the critical role of mapping out policies that strike a balance between preserving America's natural resources and tapping them for energy and recreational purposes. Secretary Salazar has promised to work with President Obama to take the moonshot on energy independence. A graduate of Colorado College in 1977 and the University of Michigan, Secretary Salazar has made a name for himself as a lawyer earlier in his career on water issues. He went on to serve as executive director of Colorado's Department of Natural Resources and later served the state's attorney general and then as a senator from the state of Colorado. Secretary Salazar received honorary doctorates of law from Colorado College and the University of Denver. He's made a name for himself as a staunch conservationist and by controversially opposing oil shale leases in the West. He said in a speech on the Senate floor, we need to be honest with ourselves and the American people about our energy future. We simply cannot drill our way to energy independence. Please welcome back to the City Club, Secretary of the Interior, Ken Salazar. Thank you uh, very much, Hugh, for that uh, kind introduction. And uh, thank you for the members of uh, the City Club of Cleveland for giving me the opportunity to come and uh, speak to you about uh, the energy programs of the nation and some very important issues that uh, are on my plate as we move forward with uh, implementing President Obama's vision for uh, the new energy frontier for the United States of America. So what I want to do today is uh, say, first of all, uh, Ohio is a wonderful place. Uh, for me, there are many special places in this country, but Ohio is a place where I actually studied to be a Franciscan priest. So before I went on to be a lawyer and a father of my own children, uh, I was in uh, Cincinnati, Ohio at Mount Healthy, where uh, I uh, studied there with the Franciscan priest for a couple of years when I was in high school many years ago. And I have not been back there since I left uh, at the end of my sophomore year, but uh, someday I would like to visit there again. And then last time I think I was in Ohio was actually when I came to speak to the Cleveland Club, City Club here, where we uh, had been working on what is one of the most important uh, national icons that we have in our national park system, uh, Cuyahoga National Park, and uh, the major investments that we've made there over the years, where uh, we at the time, and still continue today, to believe that uh, the 397 national parks, our 556 national wildlife refuges, and the conservation agenda of the country are very much a part of the job creation agenda of the United States of America. We have had a recent independent group that said just through outdoor recreation alone and our conservation uh, initiatives uh, in this country, uh, there are some 8 million jobs a year that are created there. And a uh, group that uh, Mackenzie International that developed a report on the jobs for the future for the next 10 years in the United States 
uh, found that uh, with the right kind of investments in uh, conservation and preservation and uh, outdoor recreation, that we can create an additional 1.1 to 2.2 million jobs in the United States over the next 10 years. And so I'm proud today that President Obama has appointed uh, Secretary Bryson and me to head up uh, a national tourism strategy uh, effort where uh, we will be implementing an effort to make sure that uh, all of the world knows about how wonderful places like Ohio are and how the United States uh, will become once again the top uh, tourist and travel destination uh, from around the world. Uh, so I'm very proud of that work that we do uh, on conservation uh, in the Department of the Interior. Now today, uh, my comments, as uh, Hugh uh, said, uh, uh, are going to be about energy and uh, about the President's plan for developing and uh, implementing uh, a new energy plan for the United States of America. And it's right at the outset to ask the question, uh, well, we have been in three years, uh, and so what are the deliverables in three years? And I'm proud to say that uh, from day one we have been working hard on a strategy that involves uh, tapping into all of the energy resources of the United States of America. And I think as I go through uh, some of the milestones that we have achieved over the last three years, I am very proud of uh, the accomplishments that we've made, and I think the United States of America should be very proud of the accomplishments as well. So I want to uh, start out by just saying I was, uh, a few, a few uh, hours ago, uh, I was in Kent with uh, the uh, owner and the founder of uh, Mac Trailer, a gentleman, a gentleman by the na name of Mike Connie. And uh, as I toured the facility with him, uh, they are building trailers there, trailers that are going to be used uh, in the hydraulic uh, fracking and the delivery of fluids uh, to uh, well sites uh, around the country. And they also are involved in uh, transportation uh, through manufacturing trailers in uh, three different places here in Ohio. And it was a story which is truly the story of the American dream. It's a story which uh, many of you dream about, which uh, you who are young people here are still charting your careers. Ought to be thinking about uh, what, uh, what, uh, what Mike Connie has done with his company. Uh, 1992, he starts his company out with uh, just himself uh, in a garage, an $8,000 loan from uh, his mother, and uh, the company takes off and it grows. And before long, uh, the company is manufacturing trailers that are used around the country, and at that point in time, he has 500 employees in his company. So from a garage uh, to a company that had 500 employees. And then the greatest economic crisis that has hit our country since the Great Depression hit, and it hit here in Ohio as well. And you remember that year of 2008. And so their company, from 500 employees, went down to less than 150 employees in 2008. The recession hit. That was how hard the crisis hit one company. But they weren't to be deterred. And so they continued to work and look for opportunities and developing new product lines. And today, they have 900 employees in 2012. And uh, the people who are working there, many of them in the new facility that they just opened up several months ago, have just been employed now for uh, the last two or three months. But they are hiring on the average of 10 people uh, every two weeks, and so the company continues to grow. And we see that happening in manufacturing all around the country. And so my point in uh, visiting uh, the company at, um, at in Kent was to see what the connection was between what we're doing with uh, energy and uh, with natural gas and what's happening in manufacturing here in Ohio. And there in what I would call an exhibit A of what's happening uh, across the country, we saw a company that is uh, growing, that has a very healthy economic future, uh, people who are working who had been previously unemployed, and so it reinforces the fact that we're on the right track to the kind of economic recovery that all of us as Americans can be very proud of. When I became Secretary of Interior, uh, the President asked me to work on a uh, number of different things. But one of the most important things that he asked me to work on was to work on the energy future of the United States, to work with my colleague uh, in the Department of Energy, Secretary Chu, and other members of the administration in mapping out uh, an energy future for the United States of America that would bring about energy security to these United States. Uh, many of you in this room uh, who are of my generation, and maybe even a little bit younger, uh, remember those days back when uh, President Nixon uh, coined uh, the term energy independence in the early 1970s. And then you remember well when uh, 
President Jimmy Carter in 78 and 79 said that we had to move forward with energy independence with the moral imperative of war, with the moral imperative of war. And then you saw what happened through the 80s and the 90s from importing about 30 percent of our oil in the 60s and 70s. All of a sudden, we are importing as much as 70 percent of our oil from foreign countries. And so many of us have been involved in the clarion call for our nation to move forward to a new sense of uh, energy independence, to really rescue ourselves from an addiction on the importation of foreign oil, to bringing about the uh, energy independence that is good for America on a number of different cornerstone, cornerstones of who we are as a nation. One of those cornerstones is uh, our national security. Uh, when we think about the fact that much of our oil is imported from places that are hostile and don't share the interests of the United States, we should find ways of ending that. When uh, you look at what's at stake in terms of the hundreds of billions of dollars every year that are sent from this country to places that are far away, that money is not creating jobs here in the United States of America. So the more that we can produce in our energy here at home, uh, the more we'll be able to do to help uh, secure the economic future of the United States. And we also need to understand that uh, as we move forward with the new energy future, finding uh, opportunities to develop uh, energy resources that are renewable and clean energy resources are something which are important uh, for the environmental security of our nation as well. So it's around those principles, really, that the President, from day one, uh, through uh, my department and the other departments of uh, the United States of America, have been implementing uh, the blueprint for our energy future. And that's why I want to spend a few minutes uh, here today talking to you about and then taking uh, questions from you. Uh, and uh, well, they're easy questions, hard questions, whatever you want to ask me, I'm, I'm happy to try to answer them. Um, so let me just uh, speak just first about some of the things that we have already done. We have made uh, a major change in how we develop renewable energy in the United States of America. And in my view, we can't afford to make a U-turn and go back to the days when renewable energy was uh, looked at as an afterthought. And I'll give you just a few examples. In the area of solar, we have now 41 new solar energy manufacturing facilities in the United States of America. We are projected to be the number one solar energy market in the world by the year 2014. A few years ago, people thought that that world and that competition was going to be lost to Germany and China and other countries. We're on our way to being number one. We, as well, have uh, moved forward with uh, major efforts on wind energy, where we now have over 400 companies that are involved in uh, the manufacturing of wind turbines and other components that are fueling our wind energy industry. A third of all the electrical generation that has been created in this country over the last three years has actually come from electricity that is being created from wind farms that are being stood up all across America. And oil and gas production, and oil production, we are now producing more oil domestically here in the United States since at any time since uh, Ronald Reagan was president. That's oil that we're producing both onshore as well as offshore. And in the area of natural gas, uh, we now, because of the great uh, technological breakthroughs that have been made by the private sector, but with the great investment also of uh, the United States of America, the United States Geological Survey and Agency in my department, as well as the Department of Energy and the National Energy Labs, we now know that we have enough natural gas to basically supply the energy needs of the United States of America for 100 years, for 100 years. So you look at all of those components of what the President calls his all of the above strategy, we are making significant progress. And in 2011, uh, for the first time in uh, as long as I can remember, the oil imports that are coming into the country dropped below 50 percent. In fact, they're hovering right at about 45 percent for the year 2011. That's all because we have moved forward to really capture these new sources of energy and develop them around, around the country. I want to speak to uh, just a few of uh, these uh, aspects in, in just a little bit more detail. Uh, on renewable energy, when I became Secretary of Interior in 2009, there were zero solar projects of a commercial scale that had been permitted around the country. And uh, the uh, 
uh, millions and millions of acres which I oversee on behalf of the American people. There were zero solar energy projects that have been permitted on our public lands in the domain of the Department of the Interior. Today, we have 29 projects, and they include the largest solar commercial scale facilities in the entire world. And they're being stood up in places in California and Nevada and uh, Arizona, where we know we have the highest quality of solar energy in the United States of, of America. We've done uh, the same thing with respect to wind energy and with respect to geothermal. So at this point in time, uh, in my department alone, we've permitted uh, 5,600 megawatts, which is about, of renewable energy, which is about uh, the equivalent of, uh, of 18 uh, to 20 uh, uh, coal-fired power plants and the energy that would come from those coal-fired power plants. That's how much renewable energy has been permitted to come up on our public lands, and those projects are underway. I have visited several of them just in the last month and a half, and uh, I've seen the thousands of workers who are out there building these facilities, which are really making believers out of skeptics that we can, in fact, capture the power of the sun to uh, power our cities across, across America. The President of the State of the Union was very clear that we need to continue with this major push on uh, renewable energy. And he directed me and the Department of Interior to have authorized by the end of 2012 10,000 megawatts of renewable energy power. I have no doubt that we will, in fact, meet that goal, and in fact, uh, that we will surpass that goal by the end of, by the end of, of 2012. Natural gas, let me just uh, make a few factual statements about it. Uh, we are, in fact, the leading, we have become the leading producer of natural gas in the world in the last three years. It's something that we are proud of, and we support uh, natural gas. There are some people who uh, would say that uh, we are not supportive of the natural gas industry, well, that's uh, wrong if they reach those conclusions because uh, from day one, I remember having conversations about the importance of uh, the possibility at that time of bringing a uh, pipeline to capture the natural gas resources from Alaska down into the lower 48. And we've continued to push uh, the production of uh, natural gas uh, here in, in, uh, in our country. Uh, the experts tell us that uh, natural gas has the potential to create 600,000 jobs uh, by the end of this decade. And so as part of the job creation program for the United States of America, it's an important part of uh, the President's energy blueprint. There's a number of things that we can do uh, to move forward with uh, making sure that this very abundant uh, domestic supply, American supply of energy, is uh, developed. One of them is uh, to move forward and making sure that there is demand for this uh, natural gas, this very abundant supply that is out there. And so the President, uh, in a trip to the West, visited uh, facilities uh, like those of UPS, where uh, UPS is now converting its entire vehicle fleet over to natural gas. Uh, now, there's an economic reason why they're doing it, and it's because uh, natural gas is about a third the price of diesel or gas. And so there are many companies around the country that are actually moving in and uh, taking advantage of this very abundant uh, domestic supply. We in the federal government, with the President's direction are moving forward as well by uh, being examples of how we can use uh, natural gas in, uh, our, in our vehicle fleet, fleets. Uh, the next point I would make about natural gas is as we move forward, forward with natural gas, uh, there is a huge debate that is flaring around the country on hydraulic uh, fracturing, uh, hydraulic uh, fracking. Huge debate that's flaring here in Ohio about whether or not uh, hydraulic uh, fracturing is safe and uh, what it is that uh, we ought to be doing about that. But let me uh, make just a couple of uh, points on, uh, on hydraulic fracking. First, uh, I believe as uh, Secretary of Interior that hydraulic fracking uh, can be done safely and in fact is being done safely in most cases. Uh, in fact, uh, when you look at what we call enhanced oil recovery uh, injection uh, processes, they've been around for 50 years. Uh, uh, fluids being injected into the underground to loosen up the materials and the formations to allow more oil recovery to come up. In fact, uh, we have wells in my native state of Colorado where we actually produce carbon dioxide in order to be able to inject it into the underground so that we can produce the enhanced oil from these wells. So what we do to enhance oil recovery and natural gas by injection of gases and fluids into our earth is something that has been around for a very long time. And so 
I believe that natural, that natural gas uh, production and exploration can be done safely and can be done responsibly. The President endorses that concept. Uh, it is his view, and he talked about it in the State of the Union, that we wanted to move forward with uh, natural gas development. But he also said that we need to make sure that we're doing it a, in a safe and responsible way. And so in the Department of Interior in uh, the next several weeks, you will see us making an announcement about how we're moving forward with uh, three rules that relate to how we will allow uh, natural gas to be developed in the public estate of the United States of America. Now, it doesn't cover the entire United States, but the fact of the matter is that uh, in my department we oversee the mineral estate and the oil and gas estate for about 700 million acres. So that's about one out of three acres uh, in the United States of America. And we want to make sure that when your lands, because they are the lands of the American people, when the oil and gas is being extracted from those lands, that we're doing it in the right way and we're doing it in a responsible way. And so what we will require will be full disclosure of the fluids that are being injected into our earth. And secondly, we will also require that the well bore itself has full integrity uh, when it is constructed and also checked after the formation is fracked. That we will make sure there is no contamination from any fracking that occurs out into the water bearing formations. And third, we also will require that what they call the flow back water that comes back after the fracking fluids are injected, that those flow back waters don't contaminate our streams. To me, those rules are common sense. To me, those rules are common sense. And if we do not move forward with that kind of a program from the Department of Interior, what I is, and if we don't move with that kind of program around the country, my own view is that uh, the failure of disclosure and the failure of making the, giving the American people confidence that hydraulic fracking will in fact work will end up being the Achilles heel to the natural gas promise of the United States of America. Because right now, the political debate that wages, whether it's in Ohio or Pennsylvania or New York or my native state of Colorado, is whether or not hydraulic fracking should in fact be allowed to continue. Well, you can understand where citizens would come from when uh, they frankly don't know what it is that's being injected into the underground. Is it toxic fluids that somehow at some point are going to escape or what is it that's being injected into the underground? It seems to me that uh, the American public who owns uh, these 700 million acres of mineral estate has a right to know, has a right to know about what is being injected into the underground. And I think when they know, and when they have confidence that uh, fracking can occur in a safe way, that the natural gas world that we are developing, which the President endorses and embraces, that's a world which we'll be able to develop. But I think those three things are very important for us to do. And so in the weeks ahead, uh, you will see my department uh, making a formal announcement on the specifics of this rule. Now, you'll have some people who will say it's going to kill the natural gas industry. But that's uh, very far from the truth. Uh, when I was out at uh, MAC this morning, uh, Jim Cooney uh, told me that, talked to me about his farming background. He runs cattle, owns a thousand some acres outside of Kent. And he was telling me that he, as a farmer, understands the importance of making sure that our water is clean and that our soils are protected. And so he said that he thought that these rules that we're working on are common sense rules. Well, his future, in terms of develop for his company, in terms of developing the trailers that he's developed, that, that, that they are constructing, manufacturing there to take the hydraulic uh, uh, fluids out into the well pads, his future is very dependent on a robust natural gas industry. But he recognizes as a farmer, as I do as a rancher and farmer, that it's important that we take care of our land and our water and our soil. And we believe that we can do it safely. So stay tuned for uh, what, uh, our announcement on, 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 uh, on hydraulic fracking and the disclosure requirements there. Let me uh, move just a little bit to uh, oil uh, production. You know, we have uh, moved forward in uh, developing uh, the oil resources on public lands in the United States in a very robust way over the last three years. And yes, uh, April 20th of uh, 2010 is the day that I will always remember along with the 87 days after uh, 
the Maconda Well and the Deepwater Horizon blew up in uh, the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, because during those days, on average, uh, some 50,000 barrels of oil spewed out into the Gulf of Mexico. Now, some people believe that, uh, you know, that happened there, but it can't ever, ever happen again. But that's not our view. You know, our view has been that what we need to do is to make sure that we have the kind of uh, regulatory oversight and regime in place to make sure that it doesn't uh, ever happen again. And so we have worked very hard on leading the uh, most uh, major overhaul of oil and gas production in America's oceans from the very beginning of the time of this uh, republic. And so we have moved forward again uh, with uh, leasing and with production in uh, the Gulf of Mexico and America's oceans. And in the Gulf of Mexico in particular, uh, we have already held a lease sale, which we held in December, a small tract of land. We call them parcels out in America's oceans. Uh, they're three by three uh, miles, so about nine square miles. Uh, one tract of land actually uh, was bid on for over $100 million just because of the extent of the oil resources that are in the Gulf of Mexico. So about a third of our oil and natural gas are now in the nation that we consume here in the United States, so we produce domestically, are actually co coming from the Gulf of Mexico. And we intend to continue to move forward with uh, production uh, in America's oceans in the Gulf. But there are other places as well that we intend to uh, look at for uh, the possibility of development. We need to make sure that uh, those places, uh, if they are explored and when they are explored, that it's being done in a uh, safe way, in a way to make sure that we are safeguarding our environment. And so from places like uh, the, Ar the Alaska and the Arctic Seas, we are moving forward with examining the possibility of uh, exploration within those seas. Uh, we have to understand that exploration does not mean development. What exploration means is that we're de developing additional information and additional science on what is there. It seems to me that the American people have a uh, right to know what uh, the resources are that exist within uh, the uh, sovereignty of the United States of America. So these decisions have not yet been made, but we will see over the next uh, several weeks and months uh, what exactly will be happening in the Arctic Seas and both the Beaufort and the Chukchi Seas of Alaska in, uh, in, in the year ahead, including in the summer of 2012. And as we move forward to that program, we also have to look to the onshore resources of the United States where we have le leased uh, millions and millions of acres on the public lands for uh, oil and gas production. Uh, one place is in Alaska, where the National Petroleum Reserve, the so-called NPRA, which is about a 22 million acre uh, tract of property, which uh, the BLM oversees, where development uh, had not occurred for a very long time. But uh, under the leadership of uh, the Deputy Secretary of Interior, uh, David J. Hayes, We've put together a coordinated federal permitting uh, program so that uh, the EPA and the Department of Defense and the Fish and Wildlife Service and all the other agencies that are involved essentially are working together so that uh, we work in parallel as opposed to having a bureaucracy where you go through one agency and get a permit only to have it vetoed in another place. And so as a result of his work, what we are seeing now is a possibility of moving forward with uh, oil production in the National Petroleum Reserve in Alaska. Now, why is that important? Uh, it's important because we need the oil. Uh, it's better if we have it here in this country to develop it here as opposed to importing it from some other source. But it also is important because the Trans-Alaska Pipeline has been declining in the flow through of that pipeline where now it is less than half full and all the projections are that it's going to continue to decline. Well, the MPRA, where you already have development on the state lands right outside of this 22 million acre tract, are already in full development, and they are providing oil into this pipeline that brings a significant amount of our oil here into the continental, uh, the, 40, the lower 48. And so we will expect to see drilling as well in the MPRA, and we expect as well to uh, have lease sales that have been ordered by the president to be held there in the National uh, Petroleum uh, Reserve. So there's a lot happening uh, in the world of uh, energy for the United States. Uh, at the end of the day, it is about jobs here in America. It's about the national security of the United States. And it also is about the environmental security of our country. So as the president spoke about his vision in the State of the Union on the energy future of the United States, he captured these programs. 
He knew that what we had been working on the last three years was right, that we couldn't do a U-turn on renewable energy because we really have made a very significant uh, uh, set of achievements over the last several years. He knew that the natural gas future of the United States was also a very bright future, but we need to do it in a way to make sure that we're protecting our land and our water and our wildlife. And he knew as well that uh, we need to develop our oil resources in a responsible and thoughtful way across the country. So when you put all of that together, uh, I think you look back at the last three years and we've had a lot of accomplishments. We have a lot more to go, uh, but uh, there is no doubt in my mind that uh, those fundamental policy issues that are so important to the country are ones that our energy blueprint, the President's energy blueprint, uh, will in fact address. So thank you all very much and uh, be happy to take uh, questions. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we're listening to a special forum featuring Secretary of the Interior Ken Salazar. We'll return to Secretary Salazar momentarily for the traditional City Club question and answer period. We encourage you all to formulate your questions now and please remember to keep them brief. We remind you all that you're entitled to and welcome at uh, all of the City Club forums. We'd like to see you here and we also would encourage you, if you're not a member of the City Club, to become a member of the City Club. We can use your support. We welcome all of you here today and those listening to WCPN 90.3 FM, WCLV, WTAM, or one of the many radio stations across the country. Our television broadcast partners are w is WBIZ PBS Ideastream, and television broadcasts the City Club are made possible by Cleveland State University and PNC. Our live webcast is supported by the University of Akron. There are several great programs scheduled for the remainder of February including Angela Glover Blackwell, founder and CEO of PolicyLink, special new leaders forum with Paul Clark, regional president of PNC Bank, and several debates. Please visit our website at www.cityclub.org for the most up-to-date information on what we have going on at the City Club. If you miss, wish to make reservations for upcoming programs or order a CD or DVD of today's program, please call 1-888-223-6786 or 216-621-0082. Today is the John W. Barkley Memorial Forum made possible by a generous gift to the City Club endowment by Mr. Barkley's estate. We would like to thank his family for their support. Now we'd like to return to Secretary Salazar for our traditional City Club question and answer period. We welcome questions from any and all of you. And holding the microphone today, we have Carrie Miller, who is our program director. First question, please. Thank you for your remarks. Sandra Steingraber is well known for being a watchdog for toxics that come into the environment. She has said that air pollution is the biggest problem uh, for hydrofracking. You've mentioned protecting land and water and wildlife. What about protection for air? What is your name? My name is Nancy King Smith. Nancy? Nancy, uh, the air parts of uh, natural gas production are, are very important as well to address. And so there are companies now, for example, uh, I'll mention one company by name, Anadarko, in uh, the greater natural buttes area of Utah uh, that is moving forward with a major natural gas play. And what they have done, based on uh, an agreement with uh, EPA and the Department of Interior, is come up with a, a program where they are implementing best practices relative to their natural gas play. And that includes addressing uh, the issues of uh, emissions from uh, those uh, uh, well sites, including uh, the, the fuels that are used to run their engines and making sure that air quality is protected. So within our own efforts, uh, as we do support the development of uh, oil and natural gas on the public lands of America, uh, we are very attuned to the fact that uh, air quality uh, is also a significant issue. And here again, I would say there's debate sometimes uh, that we get engaged in with uh, the oil and gas industry where some companies are willing to embrace and implement uh, best practices that do uh, make sure that our air, air is being protected and our water and our wildlife and our lands are being protected. Uh, 
Uh, and I would hope that all companies uh, that are out there uh, working at least in the public domain do that. And in fact, uh, uh, m you know, m many of them do. Ar Arnold Dom, uh, we all agree that we wish to see the fracking done in as uh, environmentally responsible way as possible. In that regard, there's a com Canadian company, Gas Frack, which uh, has fractured a thousand wells with liquid petroleum gas, or propane gel, they call it. And uh, it comes, propane gel fracks, and then it returns to the surface as a gas, not carrying with it a lot of the radioactive material, salts, and uh, chemicals. And there is no frack water to do, uh, dispose of. Uh, what can we do to ensure that, that all of us have information about this technique as compared to water fracking so that the American public can judge? And if it turns out to be more environmental friendly, as I suspect it is, how we can encourage companies to use this more expensive but also more efficient method? Thank you, Arnold. It's a, it's a very good question. Uh, first, I think that uh, the involvement of uh, the American public, as uh, obviously you have been in uh, studying the fracking issue, is very important. And so I think uh, this uh, debate that we see unfolding around the country about what ought to be done with natural gas and with fracking is an important conversation to be held, and it's important for uh, the American citizenry to be as informed and educated about the issue as possible in the way that you are. Now, in terms of the techniques that are used for hydraulic uh, fracking and uh, what is uh, less environmentally friendly uh, than other techniques, there are probably a number of techniques out there that will actually work and not harm our environment. And in fact, uh, when one looks back at uh, the history of, uh, of hydraulic fracking, it's probably about, this according to my director of uh, the BLM, more than 90 percent of all the wells that are being drilled and have been drilled uh, in the last decade on public lands have used hydraulic fracking, and uh, we don't have a uh, single incident of a of proven contamination uh, from these wells, uh, at least with respect to water supply. Okay, and so the question is, can it be done safely? And we believe that it can. Now, can it be done in ways where we make sure that the best technologies are being used, including perhaps uh, the technology that you described with uh, the, inject the injection of, uh, of gas to, to, to create the fracking. That is all very, real, very possible. And so yesterday, as uh, the President announced uh, his budget uh, for 2013, one of the things that uh, he announced is that we are going to continue to study uh, hydraulic fracking through uh, major investments that uh, will examine uh, all of the aspects of hydraulic fracking, fracking through the United States Geological Survey in my department. We have a $15 million request uh, into the Congress to help us uh, study uh, hydraulic fracking and this option, these options. My colleague, Secretary Chu, at the Department of Energy is also working uh, to make sure that all of these uh, options are, are looked at. But at the end of the day, we believe that natural gas uh, can, in fact, uh, be produced safely. And we believe that it is hydraulic uh, fracking or the fracturing of the formations. I mean, you can fracture it, as you say, through uh, natural gas or, or other, uh, other injections. But it can, it can be done uh, in a way that uh, does not harm the environment. And so that's uh, what we will be, uh, we will, we will be working on, developing the science to make sure that we are looking at the best practices that will leave the least environmental footprint in the development of this gas. Thank you. First off, I'd like to thank you for coming here today, Mr. Secretary. My name's Mark Mangan, and I'm a victim of gas well drilling gone wrong. Um, I've been in touch with the federal EPA, um, ODNR, and the federal EPA has actually involved the CDC, the Agency for Toxic Substance and Disease Registry. Um, they have actually deemed our water wells explosive and our homes to be public health hazards. Um, ODNR, when they did their investigation, um, to put it lightly, I would say was borderline criminal. Um, I have some information here I'd like to give you today. These are cement tickets for when they cemented in the casing for the surface casing and the conductor casing. And both of these casings were cemented in, when you look at the drill log, before they ever started drilling the hole. And that's not possible to ever happen. And 
ODNR made quite a few mistakes like this that I have proof from. I've actually um, have involved the FBI now, and they're investigating the case as well. Question. My question is, it being done safely, sir, my neighbors, I, I have two neighbors that have now been diagnosed with cancer because of our toxic water. Um, the 20-year-old daughter was diagnosed with breast cancer. The mother was just diagnosed last week. She's not going to make a year. It's not being done safe. We need help. Can you help us? Yeah, Mark, uh, first let me say that um, you speak to an issue that obviously you feel uh, very strong about and uh, you've seen people who have been hurt by what, as you state the facts, uh, is an appropriate uh, construction of a well. And so I think your, your governor uh, here in Ohio and the State of the Union, a, a Republican, uh, made the statement that uh, in his uh, State of the State that uh, while he supported natural gas moving forward and that many companies were responsible companies, maybe most companies were responsible companies, that there were some what he characterizes yay-hoo companies who will do the job wrong. And so that's why as we move forward with uh, the natural gas agenda of this country, Mark, it's going to be important that what we do is institute these efforts, which we will be instituting at the Department of Interior on at least 700 million acres. And those are the requirements that address disclosure of what is being injected into our earth. Second of all, which uh, probably would address the issue which uh, you faced uh, in your neighborhood, and that's uh, that there be integrity in the well bore, both uh, during construction, after construction, and after the fracking occurs. Those, are all, those will all require, those will all make sure that uh, a, a well that will create uh, problems like the ones uh, that you state uh, do not in, in, in fact happen. And then the third part of what we uh, hope to be able to do is to put into place uh, a program that also addresses what happens with the flow back fluids. Because right now, the fluids are injected uh, into the well. The fracking occurs, and there's a significant amount of water that flows back through the well. We need to make sure that uh, those fluids are not creating problems to public health or to the environment. And so that's what we will be doing uh, under the President's uh, directive uh, within the Department of the Interior. Now, in my department, uh, we don't uh, cover the public lands. That's uh, in the jurisdiction of, of EPA. And uh, our hope is that what we decide to do on uh, America's public lands, which are your lands, will also serve as a template for what will happen in the private lands across America where natural gas is also being developed. Thank you. They're actually drilled in, in Medina County Park system. And it, it's not private land where a neighbor did this. It's, it's actually on park property. And now with drilling into all the state parks, most of the homes around there are also going to be on wells. What are you going to do to protect those people? Well, I think, as I said, it, my, uh, my, my premise after having studied the subject for a long time is that hydraulic cracking can be done safely, okay? But you need to have the safeguards to protect the people and to protect the environment. And uh, that's what we are, we are trying to do. And I'd be happy to take your letter and see whether there's a, a, a place where we might be able to be helpful. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Mr. Secretary, my name is Dick Pace, and I want to uh, thank you for all your support here at the Cuyahoga Valley uh, National Park. Uh, it's a great park, and I hope that you can continue to support it and follow John Debo's uh, leadership in connecting it to its origin at the canal basin at the mouth of the Cuyahoga River. We'd love to see that. The community would love to see that, my, which leads me to my question, which is protecting the Great Lakes from the Asian carp invasion, and what, what will you be doing? That's been really on hold. It's been, uh, you know, put on the back burner by the Obama administration, and now with the mayor of Chicago being a former chief of staff, what's what's going to happen? How will we, how will you prevent the Asian carp from uh, decimating our Great Lakes? Thank you. Well, Dick, uh, first, let me say I disagree with your conclusion that we put the Great Lakes on uh, hold or even uh, the Asian carp issue on hold at all. Uh, we have uh, invested literally. Uh, millions and millions of dollars on uh, the Great Lakes and uh, its restoration. 
uh, because I oversee the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, dealing with the Asian carp issue and uh, spreading its uh, invasion uh, f uh, into the Great Lakes uh, is one of our highest priorities within the Department of Interior. I get a briefing uh, almost once a week uh, on what is happening with uh, the Asian carp. And in fact, if you look at uh, the budget from last year as well as the budget from this year, the investments that are going on to study how it is uh, that we can deal with uh, this invasive species is something which is of high priority to uh, the Department of the Interior, uh, to uh, EPA that is leading the Great Lakes Restoration Task Force, and uh, we will do everything within our power to be able to uh, address uh, the issue of the, uh, of, of the Asian carp in, in, in the Great Lakes. I will tell you as well that um, these issues are very difficult issues when you're dealing with invasive species. There was a, a magic wand or some investment uh, that we could make that essentially would uh, wipe out the problem. We would do that. Uh, I'll give you an example of something that has gotten away from the United States of America, not in the Great Lakes, but in the Everglades, where uh, we have invested uh, nearly $800 million just in the last three years in the restoration of uh, one of these uh, world heritage uh, ecosystem restoration projects. And I have led that effort uh, on behalf of uh, the President and on behalf of all the stakeholders involved in the Everglades. We have a snake, uh, the Burmese python, that basically an invasive species that came in as a, a pet. They get a little too big. And so what happens is uh, people decide that the pet should no longer be in their home because they're dangerous. So they release them into the Everglades. Well, uh, the USGS in a report that uh, they finalized just in the last several weeks found that uh, bobcats and uh, much of the native uh, 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 habitat and species in the Everglades is being decimated by this outbreak of the Burmese python. So we've made it illegal for the importation of, uh, of the Burmese python and four, four other uh, or three other species of snakes into this country and are doing everything we can to eradicate them from existence in the Everglades. And so uh, we are uh, putting the same kind of effort uh, into the Asian carp issue and the same kind of effort into the restoration of, of the Great Lakes. And uh, I'd be happy to give you more additional information on it. And thank you for caring. I mean, it is, uh, you know, I, I remember coming to Cuyahoga, Cuyahoga, I guess the way you pronounce it here, right, a couple of years ago. And I remember uh, the tour with our uh, superintendent uh, where we saw uh, the river as it used to be. And uh, we saw Lake Erie in the way that it used to be. And I remember the conversation that I had about how uh, it was the river that caught on fire. And uh, it was really what led to the modern environmental movement. Under a Republican president, Richard Nixon, who said we need to make sure that we are standing up and uh, defending the quality of our waters in these United States. Uh, well, we have made major progress really since uh, the time when the river caught on fire. Uh, we still have a lot more ways to go. And so it's a great, I, mean, it's, I spend a very significant part of my time working on the America's Great Outdoors agenda and the conservation agenda on behalf of, of, of the President. So I uh, look forward to coming back and visiting what is uh, one of the, I, I, I was told, one of the uh, five most visited uh, national parks uh, here in the United States. Uh, welcome to Cleveland, Secretary Salazar. I have a question um, as a fellow Westerner about the proposed Green River um, nuclear plant, especially out of concern for the over-appropriated nature of the Colorado Green River Corridor. What is your name? Jennifer Parker. Okay. Now, Jennifer, tell, can you tell me a little bit more about the Green River nuclear plant? Because uh, I have not heard of it until this very moment where you raised it with me, <laughs> but I know enough about the water issue that I can respond to the water issue. Okay. <laughs> a little bit more about the, about the I, I don't know very much of it myself. I know the, the rafting community in that area, and there's a, um, some talk going on about a proposed nuclear plant that would be taking water as part of the nuclear process out of that area. Okay, well, let me, uh, I don't know. I don't have any information on this specific uh, proposal and this specific plan, but let me comment to your question on two issues. One is uh, nuclear energy and, and the other is water and uh, water across our country. 
Uh, on the nuclear uh, effort, uh, you know, the President has been clear as well that uh, nuclear energy is part of our energy portfolio for uh, the future. And so, you know, in the last several weeks, you've seen uh, you know, the authorization of uh, a small plant in, in Georgia. So we're looking at ways and how we can move forward with uh, nuclear. Uh, my colleague, Secretary Chu, is uh, at the forefront of making sure that uh, as nuclear is developed in the United States, that it is done uh, in the safest, uh, responsible way so that uh, incidents like what happened at Three Mile Island and other incidents like that uh, don't occur uh, here in the United States. On the water issue, uh, I think that water is an issue which uh, always has to look, be looked at when you're, you're dealing with uh, energy development. And so one of the biggest issues which I have been very involved in has been the development of oil shale, uh, which is basically in Wyoming and Utah and Colorado, you being from the West would know those uh, three states are uh, some of the have some of the most beautiful rivers in our in our nation, including uh, the Green River and the Amper River and, and the Colorado River Basin. And so, with respect to oil shale, uh, we move forward with research and development. But I have said uh, uh, that we are not going to move forward with uh, commercial scale development of oil shale because we don't know what it will mean, especially to the water that is required to essentially take. And this is not gas; it is not what we're dealing with in terms of uh, some of the issues here in Ohio. It's basically taking rock shale and heating it up uh, to the point where it melts and then extracting the oil, uh, the millions of acre feet of water that would be required to develop oil shale in the West is something that is of huge concern to me when I look at the states of Wyoming and Utah and Colorado and the seven states that depend on the Green River and uh, the Colorado River Basin. And so, uh, you know, I, I don't know about the nuclear plant that, that uh, that raised the question, but it's uh, something that I will become familiar with. Thank you. Thank you for being here today. My name is Donald Cairns, and my question deals with this pipeline that's been so controversial to take oil from Canada across our country to the Gulf refineries. Would you outline the pros and the cons? Also explain how it became political, and what do you think is going to happen? Uh, Hugh and Jim Foster, you know, you, 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 you train the members of the Cleveland City Club and your attendees to ask very specific questions. You know, they ought to be members of the news media. <laughs> Never met <laughs> uh, Donald, let me, uh, let me uh, say this about the Keystone uh, Pipeline and, and its controversy uh, first. Uh, the President and the Administration have never reached a judgment as to whether or not it should be built. Uh, the decision that uh, came down from uh, the State Department was uh, essentially that there was not enough time to be able to evaluate uh, the proposal which has yet to be filed on the alternative route that has been proposed uh, for the pipeline. Uh, when the pipeline was proposed, you had uh, the Republican governor of Nebraska, the Republican United States senator of Nebraska saying that they opposed the route because it was going to go over some very sensitive lands, potential for uh, spillage into and, and some contamination into the Ogallala Aquifer, which uh, provides a water supply for uh, much of the farming agricultural community in Nebraska. And so they were the ones who were opposed to it and were uh, essentially stating that these concerns ought to be looked at. So. The State Department, which is uh, the permitting agency here, said uh, they were looking at all of the issues. But before they were able to get to a decision, again in a political year, you had the Republican-controlled House of Representatives saying that the pipeline must be approved no matter what the concerns are, and they had to do it by a certain time period. Well, there was no way that the State Department could move forward and engage in the complete process to make sure that all of the environmental impacts and other issues that were being raised by the Republican governor of Nebraska and others were in fact addressed. And indeed, as of today, uh, my understanding in terms of the most recent information I have is that there is no proposal on this alternative route that would go around the original proposed uh, route, that no proposal has even been put on the table for evaluation. So if you have a pipeline that is the size of this pipeline that is to be built, it seems to me that the American people are entitled to know 
what the consequences are going to be uh, to the environment and that the law is followed and that the processes are followed. At the end of the day, it may be built. And uh, you probably know the arguments for and against uh, as well as I do. You know, on the plus side, uh, it does contribute to the environmental security uh, and to the national security of the United States by uh, uh, bringing in oil from a country that is uh, friendlier than some of the countries where we are now importing our oil from. That's from a national security point of view. You know, from uh, a, uh, an environmental uh, point of view, there are other uh, energies uh, that might be uh, cleaner uh, than oil that comes from the tar sands of, of Canada. And there's other arguments that can be made, both pro and con. But at the end of the day, there has been no judgment reached uh, by the president or by uh, his administration on, on the Keystone Pipeline. There's no proposal right now that has been submitted for, uh, for processing. Hi, my name is Susan. My question is around your um, policy. I hear about shale and natural gas and oil and all of these other things that we associate with energy. But um, in a previous uh, conversation with the BP oil fellow here, the BP fellow at Cleveland Foundation, Richard Stubbe, talking to a group of students from Case Western Reserve University, he put up a pie chart and he said, 60% of the issue is conservation. So I would like to know what the, aside from public lands and wildlife habitats, et cetera, et cetera, what is the energy conservation agenda of this administration? What are we going to, how are we going to reduce the need for these extractive industries? And one thing I might suggest is to mine the patent office. Because like we saw with the compact fluorescent bulb, which was you know, created right here in Cleveland at Neela Park in response to the 1973 oil crisis, didn't make it to the market until 1995. What else might there be that we could use for energy conservation measures? Okay. It's a, a very good question, uh, Susan. And uh, let me say from day one, as part of the President's energy blueprint, uh, you know, I, I spoke about the production and generation side here today at uh, the Cleveland City Club. Uh, as part of the President's energy blueprint, one of the cornerstones of that agenda is also energy efficiency. And that comes in all kinds of forms, many of which have been implemented under the President's uh, executive authority, frankly because the Congress uh, would not have gone along with these measures. And let me just speak to a couple of those. One uh, has been the uh, much higher uh, energy efficiency that we are now building our cars with here in the United States of America. The auto industry is back and it is strong and uh, hundreds of thousands of jobs are being created through the auto industry. But part of it is that uh, the American auto industry also understood the importance of moving forward with uh, vehicles that were much more energy efficient. And so under the President's authority and uh, Secretary of Transportation La Hood and uh, EPA Administrator uh, Lisa Jackson, we now are moving forward where soon uh, the average uh, uh, mileage on gas for vehicles is going to be 35 miles to a gallon. Uh, that's going to be an incredible amount of uh, uh, oil savings that we'll be able to make in America just because we've addressed uh, the transportation use of uh, oil and, and, and gas here in this country. Uh, secondly, we also know that uh, we consume a tremendous amount of energy in our buildings. And uh, the efforts that we have done in terms of energy efficiency and the investments that we've made are the largest investments in energy efficiency, including weatherization, in the history of the United States of America. Because we understand that uh, we get our way to the kind of energy program that we need. Uh, through energy efficiency. And finally, uh, as you speak about the light bulbs, I'm reminded that just uh, uh, 10, 15 days ago, Secretary Chu and I, uh, standing on the National Mall with, uh, the, uh, with Sylvania and uh, Siemens and other, others that participated in this effort, cut the ribbon, uh, signaled the success and the celebration of the fact that we were putting in the new kind of lighting system on the National Mall that will save two-thirds of the electricity that had formerly been consumed on the National Mall just to light it up. Uh, 
So two-thirds of the electricity just with the kind of lighting that is now going into the National Mall. And yet you had uh, the House Republicans basically trying to pass a bill that would have done away with those requirements so we move forward to a more energy efficient lighting system here in America. So let me take this because uh, I know I'm just about out of time here to say, to, to, to say this uh, in response to your uh, question, Susan, and, and the questions that all of you have asked here. You know, the, the President's energy program, uh, which you can find uh, as uh, the energy blueprint, which uh, he's talked about over the last three years, including a major speech that he gave on uh, March 30th or 31st last year in Georgetown, addresses all of the buckets, if you will, of the new energy future for the United States of America. It addresses uh, production of the conventional energies like oil and gas. It addresses uh, renewable energy and alternative fuels like biofuels but also addresses very importantly the issue of, of, of efficiency which, uh, which you asked about today. So I really, uh, really appreciate that question, Susan. Let me just say to Hugh and to Jim, uh, thank you again for uh, giving me an opportunity to come and have this conversation with the members of the Cleveland City Club. Uh, it is one of the most important clubs in the United States of America, and I'm mindful of the fact uh, that so many other people who have been uh, in positions of significant responsibility, including presidents of the United States, have addressed uh, the City Club in the past. So I wish you the very best, and uh, I'd be delighted to come back and have another conversation on the issue of, of co conservation in America's great outdoors. Thank you all very much. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we've been listening to a special forum featuring Secretary of the Interior, Ken Salazar. Thank you, Secretary Salazar. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This forum is now adjourned.